being here. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the village of Tanabra uh, and the Pawnee Nation. Um, I have a few things to say before I introduce our speaker. I want to thank, first of all, uh, the Danabra Fire Department for letting us use their building and uh, the town of Danabra for welcoming everybody here, including the Pawnee Nation, over the last few years. Uh, one of the worst things that I've had bad dreams about for years now happened <coughs> this last week. But I've always said when I got up here, <coughs> I don't know what we would do without uh, Gail Pemberton and Peggy Lang. Well, this week we found out a little bit about what we would do without them because Gail was laid up and Peggy was taking care of her. So we had to scramble. <coughs> Thank goodness I could send out the word to volunteers uh, and instantly I got responses for everybody who was eager to help. And I want to thank all of you, Annette, and Dave, uh, uh, Claire Lynn, uh, Angela, all of you who jumped in and helped me out with the mix, helped me out with today's arrangements and getting everything ready to go so that Gail could take it a little bit easy and try to get back on her feet. <coughs> so thank you, all of you. Um, our programs and the center itself are strictly nonprofit. All of us, all of us are volunteers, not just the ones I just mentioned, but all of us who work uh, for and with the Pawnee Nation. Um, we count on people uh, buying things at the Pawnee Art Center, which I think is like stealing from the Pawnee because we have incredible values over there. The Pawnee artists trust us to have their things up here. We don't buy anything. We just put their things on display and sell them, taking 15%, which we use to maintain the building. We just discovered we have a leaky roof, <coughs> so we'll be hitting everybody up for even more. <coughs> but there is a jar up here for donations, and after this program, I'm gonna hustle Chuck out the side door so nobody corners him here, and we can get him over to the center where we'd like to have you join us, ask him any questions you have, have a conversation with him, I think after this program you'll understand why I know you'll want to talk to him, because he's a fascinating man. Um, so we count on sales and donations to keep this operation going. And now, for the first time, Pawnee Nation has also last, last week contacted me, and they, despite my wishes, I always said that all of these properties have to be self-sustaining. I will not uh, expect the Pawnee Nation to support uh, Nebraska properties. Well, they said, no, that's not the way it's going to be. They are part of these operations, too, in Nebraska, and so they are participating now financially in these operations, too. So they are investing not only in our community but in our state, and that's why I think all the more we need to support the Pawnee Nation, their artists, their property, by helping them out, too, by cooperating with them. People at Prairie Fire, which is a, a newspaper, have graciously sent us a whole bunch of copies, and they're free for anyone who wants one. I have an article in there about the return of properties to tribal ownership, uh, so uh, they let us have extra copies. If you're interested at all in how the Pawnee came to return here, that would be your chance to find out. In two weeks, we are gonna have another program in the same place at the same time by an absolutely fascinating speaker whom I've heard before. Uh, he, he's really worth hearing, so I hope you'll show up for that. And afterwards, we will have a reception uh, over there with refreshments, a chance to talk with Chuck, a chance to buy his book. Uh, he'll sign it for you. Uh, it's a wonderful book, a powerful statement about growing up on the Pine Ridge and being the kind of activist Chuck has been not only for uh, his nation and his people, but for all of us, actually. Uh, so please come over there, talk with Chuck, take a look at his book. Uh, this is a chance to buy one and get an autograph. And please join us there. I, I was um, on the board of the Nebraska State Historical Society, I think 25 years ago, when the Pawnee came and asked for the return of their, actually it's more than the Pawnee, many tribes, Winnebago, the Omaha, many came for the return of their remains from the boxes on the shelves of the Nebraska State Historical Society. It turned into a horrendous legal battle. I resigned in a grand funk from the Historical Society, joined in with the Pawnee. We won that battle. 
but in a way we also lost, because I knew that the State Historical Society was now in serious trouble. There was talk about joining them, just making them a part of Game and Parks, because they were in decline and they had almost nothing left to go on. The relationship of the Historical Society with Native peoples had been destroyed. I saw generations going before uh, this was ever repaired, before the Historical Society ever again had a relationship with any Native tribe. I figured that was settled, over and done. It was a couple of years later, a friend of mine who worked at the State Historical Society came to me and he said, uh, we have a new board director, board chairman of the board at the Historical Society. <coughs> I said, oh, really? They're still going to try to sell these things, huh? He said, well, you'll never guess. I said, what? He said, it's an Indian. Oh, God. You know, uh, oh, no. He said, worse, it's a Lakota. <laughs> and worse than that, he's an old Lala. Oh, God. Well, the old Lala, the <coughs> Lakota and the Pawnee were terrible enemies. There's still all kinds of insults on it. We were true. I mean, the Pawnee were done. Nothing was ever going to happen again. The State Historic Society was ruined. Well, then I found out that he wasn't just an old Lala. It wasn't just the Lakota. It was my friend and hero, Chuck Trimble, who had become chairman of the board of the State Historical Society. That was surprising. I just got goosebumps. That was surprising enough. But within two years, the Pawnee were coming up here from Oklahoma and doing an honoring dance for Chuck Trimble and the Historical Society, an unheard of honor that I literally thought I would never see in my lifetime, forever. That's the kind of man Chuck Trimble is. He's a journalist. He's a activist. He's a writer. He's an educator. He's one of the finest men I've ever known in my long life, and a hero. And I'm so proud to have him here today, my friend and brother Chuck Trimble. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> I really appreciate that. Uh, people do believe you here, don't they, after all these years? Well, no, I can't, I can't, I can't say that. on this side of the street. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you for coming. I really do appreciate it. And uh, it's a pleasure coming up here. I spoke here a few years ago and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It's always good to see such a wonderful attendance. And this is a book I'll be talking about. This is a book called Ieska. And to start it off, Ieska is a Lakota word, which means mixed blood. And actually, I'm learning more about it. It also means interpreter. Oh, before we go any further, if anybody doesn't know, Sibi Laveau, I, I just met him, but I, he's really impressed me. He's not an Ogallala, but I love him anyway. He's, <laughs> he's a member, he's a Hunkpapa a Lakota uh, from the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation in South Dakota and lives down here in uh, Long Island, in, or Long Island, Grand Island, which Roger Welsh, and I understand the city council of Dannebrog, uh, what, what, what? Annexed. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I met Sibi and uh, very impressed with him. It's good to meet you. Kola. Uh, uh, Ieska also means interpreter, I think I said. And then there's a, uh, I didn't realize there was a, uh, a spiritual Ieska also uh, that was uh, a spirit, but that translated uh, word from the spirit world to uh, the uh, human beings. And so that's something I just found. Somebody emailed me that information. Uh, I've been asked a number of times, why don't you write a book? And as I was talking to different people, why don't you write a book? And I, I had always thought that I would, but I had never really gotten around to it. Uh, 
uh, when I was, uh, from the time I was very young, I was interested in writing and I was very interested in journalism. And uh, in our high school paper, uh, I went to the school, uh, Holy Rosary Mission, which is now Red Cloud Indian School up on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And uh, at that school, I was the editor of uh, our newspaper, which was called the Tom Tom. And most of the schools had newspapers, Tom Tom, Smoke Signal, and various other things. Those names were very popular among me. Uh, that was our media at the time. Then, uh, <coughs> strangely enough, uh, well, I went to the University of South Dakota graduating from there in 1957 and uh, studied journalism. I, actually, I studied advertising, which was a combination of art and journalism up there. And then uh, when I went into the Army, uh, went over to Germany on the USS General Patch. And their little newspaper was the Patch Dispatch. And I got to be editor of the Patch Dispatch for, for a while, or at least the five days or so that it took us to get to Germany. And uh, coming back, to the United States, I uh, was in the, I ended up in the uh, aerospace industry for a while. I'm a kind of per person that never really set out to do something. I always wound up taking advantage of opportunities. And so it was really the tail wagging the dog and whatever way it wagged, I ended up in that, that profession for, for a time anyway. And uh, in the aerospace industry, I hit my Peter Principle, I guess it was called, the, your level of incompetence, that, you, <laughs> that you're not going to go any higher. So uh, I, uh, about that time, I uh, met a woman. I went to a powwow in Denver, where my company was. And my wife and I, Ann, Ann, stand up, please. That's my wife of... Fifty years, by golly. I'm very fortunate, my first wife. And she doesn't like it when I introduce her as, this is my first wife. And been there for 50 years. Uh, she and I went uh, uh, to the powwow, and we met this woman named Helen Peterson. And I had met Helen before. Uh, she... Uh, was well known throughout Indian country. She was a Lakota and Ogallala as well, and Cheyenne. Uh, and she a invited Ann and I to her house afterwards to talk uh, about Indian things. And so we went and had coffee with her. And she started talking about her experience as uh, director of the National Congress of American Indians in Washington, D.C and about the issues in Indian affairs nationwide. And these were legal issues, uh, ongoing treaty issues, water rights, land rights, hunting rights, fishing rights, everything else. And uh, it was in very intriguing what she was telling us. And when we left her house and drove back to where we lived in Boulder, Colorado, it was daylight. It was the sun, sun was out. We had spent the entire night there listening to this remarkable woman talk about Indian affairs. And as we drove home, I told Anne, that's what I want to do. So from there, I, I became involved in Indian affairs. And uh, at, uh, then I went to work with the Commission on Community Relations for the city and county of Denver and worked with uh, Native Americans and Hispanic and uh, black uh, uh, cultures, uh, people in the, in the city. But I also became the editor of uh, what was called the Indian Times. It would, uh, was editor of the uh, local organization in Denver. And uh, that was really fun because Anne wrote book reviews and I had a comic strip. And you can see some of my uh, comic strip works in this book, but this was a, uh, centered around a man named Luke Warmwater. And Luke was, <laughs> he was the hero of the, the thing. And then there were different characters in the book. There was uh, a young feminist 
Indian woman named Helen Highwater. <laughs> Come Helen Highwater. And uh, there was a man named, uh, a boy, a spoiled boy named Rusty Meanswell, which was named <laughs> after Russell Means, of course. <clears throat> and, and we had these, uh, Luke Warmwater and his wife. Luke was always the straight man. He was the wise man. And, uh, but everything centered around him. And that, that was a lot of fun doing that. And, but one of the things I saw was the dearth of news about Indian people. In the Rocky Mountain News or the Denver Post, the only time you'd ever read about Indians is when the American Indian Movement was raising hell somewhere, you know. And that was the only news you ever read. You read, never really read news about what really is going on in Indian country. And so uh, the Indian newspapers, there, are, there were a number throughout the country. And these ranged from one or two sheet mimeograph papers, if you if remember a mimeograph, uh, to pretty good sized standard newspapers, such as the Tundra Times in Alaska and the Navajo Times in the Southwest and various others. But uh, we would exchange uh, subscriptions with each other, free subscriptions. So to find out what's going on throughout the country. But uh, I was able to get a small grant to pull a number of editors together to talk about what we might do to help improve our newspapers and the, both the editorial quality, the technical quality, and the news content what we might do to work together to form an association. And we formed the American Indian Press Association and uh, uh, got enough money together to set up a news bureau in Washington, D.C. with uh, basically one writer who would uh, write the stories, fresh news. Uh, and you'd be surprised in the Indian offices in Washington, D.C., how many people wanted to leak information. So we, we were full of news, you know, that, and, uh, and they were good leaks. They weren't, you know, just uh, gossip type things. They were policy and stuff like that. And uh, so we would mail a package, just regular mail, because at that time we didn't even have fax. We didn't have, uh, certainly not the internet or anything else. So we had crank out these stories and mail them out to uh, Indian tribes that subscribe to our organization. And that was the first time that uh, we, we started with a, a news service, and that was exciting. And uh, uh, we created the American Indian Press Association. I had the honor of serving as uh, uh, the first executive director of that, but uh, in 1972, this was all happening at the end of 1960. Uh, 1960s. In 1972, I was uh, elected to serve as the executive director of the National Congress of American Indians in Washington, which is uh, a, a national organization consisting of tribes as its members. And they paid dues into the organization. And the organization did two things very important. Number one, uh, we would hold an annual convention which would bring together uh, on different years up to 5,000 people representing tribes across the United States and various other interests in Indian affairs. And in these conventions, we would bring up the issues of the day, whether it was uh, national policy on Indian affairs or whether it was water rights or land rights or the, the things that I was uh, talking about before. And uh, they would debate these issues and agree on res with, in resolution form on what the consensus was among all the tribes. And that consensus was put in form of these resolutions. And we, we'd take them back to Washington. And when we would testify uh, before Congress on these issues, uh, we would have the consensus of the tribes so we could tell you know, the senator 
that what I'm giving you here represents the consensus of Indian country. So it wasn't just who do you represent or who do you represent. And through the years, the federal government had always played Indians off on each other, Indian leaders. From the earliest history among the Sioux people, they would uh, 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 have uh, uh, American horse and Red Cloud at odds with each other. And the, the agents played them off. Uh, and we were able to pull together consensus. So we ha uh, had that, that wonderful, powerful voice. And that was a, a great experience. Uh, <clears throat> in 1978, after I uh, had uh, left the National Congress of American Indians, it's a very tiring, very stress-related uh, <laughs> job. And uh, so uh, I served through the 70s, and at, at about that time, you're, you're, you're ready to go. So uh, I retired and uh, uh, started uh, a company, Charles Trimble Company, which uh, had as its purpose to provide uh, technical and management assistance to uh, tribes throughout the uh, country. It was a for-profit corporation. But, uh, uh, and I'm not an expert on those things, but I was able to pull together teams of experts from throughout the country. So on any one contract, I can pull talent from various sources to, uh, to provide that tribe with uh, a, a high degree of uh, competence and knowledge and education to uh, help plan their, uh, uh, their uh, industries or whatever they were trying to build. And uh, frankly, uh, and people always ask me, did you get into casinos? And no, I, was, <laughs> I never could. And I, I really, some of the early casino people that had approached me to see if I wanted to get in with them uh, were, were such a kind that you really wouldn't go into business with them. And that's not the situation today. Mo most of the tribal casinos are really, uh, I think, well managed and by fairly honorable people. But uh, at that time, when it first started, it wasn't so. But uh, ac actually, uh, they got almost all the tribes uh, concentrating on uh, casinos and gaming. And so the kind of uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, economic development we were offering just wasn't, uh, there wasn't a market for it anymore. So basically I retired and, uh, and started a nonprofit to help other Indian nonprofits for, uh, but at that time when I retired, I found that I, I now was able, able to write. Uh, I had the time to, to write like I wanted to do something for a book. But I really didn't have the, and Roger could really appreciate this, I didn't have the discipline to sit down and I thought it over and I didn't want to write an autobiography because uh, in my own mind, I, I, didn't, I didn't live that exciting a life to where people, you know, would, I didn't, couldn't picture anybody wanting to read, you know, uh, uh, me from March 12, 1935 until uh, what I am, you know, now. So, uh, and the other thing was uh, a, a memoir. Did they, they had asked, are you going to write a memoir? But I thought a memoir really has to account for having done significant things. And I can't claim that either. So, but what I could claim is having participated and having watched people and great leaders doing great things, and I could write about those things. And I got an understanding of the problems that we face, and I could write about that. So those, uh, so I decided to write in the form of a column, a weekly column. And these were uh, published online at, uh, there's a Indians.com, Indians with a Z at the end, .com. And this is owned by the uh, uh, Ho-Chunks, the Winnebago's up in, uh, uh, Winnebago, Nebraska here. That's one of their industries is this, and I would write for them and that would go out online. And I noticed uh, Indian newspapers throughout the country were starting to pick up those stories. And uh, the uh, one I would write, or two, was uh, Indian Country Today out of uh, New York. 
and the other was uh, our Lakota Country Times up in, that serves the Pine Ridge and the Rosebud Indian Reservations. And these were different things that uh, I was able to write and uh, collect into what amounted to this book. This book represents several, but I wrote many, many more over the years. And, uh, excuse me. Who was it had a drink of water on TV the other, or on live? What you, it was a, uh, the Republican. supposed to reach clear over here for Yeah, and it, it, it turned out online and everything else. It was uh, De Rubio, wasn't it? Or Rubio from Florida and uh, it showed him gulping down water. And uh, I don't know why it was so embarrassing, but uh, cheers. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my book, uh, first of all, I'd broken down into sections. Uh, one is Ieska, and this was uh, about my family. And uh, I told how Ieska came about in my family and how I became an Ieska. And uh, it starts with a, a man, a young man. He was 17 years old. His name was Todd Randall. And Todd Randall ran away from home. He was, uh, he, they lived in Clay County, Missouri, which is just north of Kansas City. In fact, you drive through an area called Claycomo, uh, the Clay County, Missouri. And uh, uh, supposedly because of a cruel father, he ran away from home. And he worked his way across the Oregon Trail as a 17-year-old, which meant he probably really had to work hard. You couldn't just jump on somebody's wagon and go. You had to earn your way. And if you weren't their child, chances are they worked the heck out of you, you know. But he ended up in uh, at Fort Laramie, Laramie. And I guess it was, maybe that was Nebraska Territory at that time, or Wyoming Territory, one of the two, uh, Fort Laramie. And there he was, uh, he called himself a mule skinner. I was able to find out an awful lot of information about him as I re researched. And he's mentioned a lot in a lot of the stories and did a lot of uh, interpreting in uh, the treaty negotiations later on in life. But, uh, and he went from there, he got there in 19, or 1848. And in 1850, or no, he got there in 47. In 49, he went on to California as part of the uh, gold rush and came back two years later. In fact, I read where he came back with $3,000, which at that time was quite a bit of money. And he married a, a Lakota woman. And her name was Bead or Bright Bead. Uh, they refer to her as both beads and bright bead. And she was a, uh, a sister of a uh, Wajaja uh, warrior, uh, head soldier, uh, it, with the Rosebud Sioux tribe, the Sichangu. Sichangu is uh, Lakota, meaning burnt thigh. And uh, uh, he married her and lived with her the rest until he, uh, his death. Uh, so that made my grandfather, that was my great-grandfather. My grandfather uh, was half Indian. He was half Randall, which was uh, Irish and English, and half Lakota. And uh, he had a number of children. My oldest, or his oldest, was uh, my mother, but she was born uh, she was uh, illegitimate, but uh, her mother was a full blood and uh, her father was half. So that made her three quarters in uh, uh, blood quantum, they, they, they call it. And uh, my mother married a white man named John Guy Trimble, a wonderful man from Ottawa, Iowa. And uh, so that made me split three quarters right in half, right? That made me three eighths. So I'm three eighths. I'm a Yeska, but I'm three eighths, a little over a quarter uh, Lakota. Nevertheless, I'm an uh, enrolled member of the tribe. And uh, uh, 
So that little three quarters weighs very heavy on my life. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a Lakota. And uh, so it's, 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 it's something very heavy as part of your life. Sometimes it's forced upon you. There's no way you can deny it, you know. And sometimes it came in a, a form of discrimination. So you had to live with it. So why not claim it? Why not bring it into your heart? You know, I'm Lakota. And so that's why, that's how I came to be uh, Ieska. And uh, then I go through about my experience. First of all, uh, uh, my dad died when, just before I was two years old. It was a month shy of my second birthday that uh, he had a massive heart attack. He chopping wood and came in the house in February, February 1st, 1937, and put the wood down and fell over and uh, died shortly thereafter. But uh, so that really left my mom in a bad situation. I was number 13 born of that family. So that's why I could, people say, don't, wasn't Todd Randall your great, great grandfather? No, he was my grand, great grandfather. But my mother was 46 when I was born, so, you know, uh, that could happen. <clears throat> and, but she was devastated, pretty much, because she, was, she still had five boys. Oh, and that family of 13, seven girls were born first, and then it's five boys, and then came me, and they threw away the form then. They said, no, we don't want any more. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but she had five boys home and, and a teenage girl that was still, still home, and so she didn't know what to do. That was uh, the, uh, they had lost a farm slash ranch that they had owned uh, in the Depression, and uh, they moved back onto the reservation. And uh, he did whatever he could, he was a carpenter, uh, to earn money. And when he was gone, no more money, right? And the uh, depression was still there. It was still somewhat going on, although uh, now uh, Roosevelt was in place and they started to come out of the uh, depression. But uh, uh, when I was real small, the uh, social workers were really pushing her to adopt me out. They said, you can't, you won't be able to raise this child. And uh, she fought them, but they continued to push her to, to do that. So finally, when I was four years old, uh, she placed me in this mission boarding school. And uh, uh, I was there for uh, many years thereafter. I'd, I'd like to just read a little part of, because uh, these boarding schools are, have really come, in, come into, uh, the news in Indian country, people who have gone to these boarding schools, even now with the high rate of suicides of uh, youth on the reservations, a lot of people and a lot of sociologists and psychologists maintain that that's still unresolved grief from their ancestors having been mis mistreated and abused so badly that is now affecting the youth and their the youth, some of them are in such despair that they're killing themselves. But I really don't buy into that completely, although I think there's a, a, a much of it is valid. There are other things that are causing a lot of the, our youth to commit suicide. Uh, one is dad coming home drunk and beating up mom every night. Uh, another is uh, uh, not being able to study because of what goes on in, at the home and not being able to keep up in school and seeing, being exposed to the outside world through computers, through television, everything else. Almost all the homes on the reservation have these little dishes bringing in news throughout the world. So these kids are able to see the world around them and seeing, comparing their own life with that world around them, which in many ways is glamorized to them. So. Uh, a lot of that is just uh, absolutely despair at seeing, or seeing no great f future for themselves. 
But anyway, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, accounts of boarding schools past tell about real horrible things uh, in these boarding schools. And a lot of it's the truth. But uh, a lot of it is t exaggerated, too. Uh, but here is, uh, I'm just telling, uh, many years ago I heard the venerable, venerable Sioux elder named Sid Bird very movingly tell about his introduction to boarding school when he was a child in the early 1930s. I have heard others tell a similar story of their first day, so it must have been a common trick to separate a child from his parents to ease the parting for the parent. However, it involved betrayal in the earliest years of that child's life, often by someone he trusted. It's an experience vivid in my memory. My mother was widowed in 1937 and was disabled by grief, physical illness, and desperation at having little money and no job. She was counseled by social workers to put me up for adoption, and an adoptive couple was found on the reservation to take me a non-Indian couple. Two years later, with increasing pressure on her to give me up, my mom decided instead to place me in a Catholic mission school, even though I was only four years old at the time. It was to be the first time I would be away from home for an extended period, and I dreaded it. My brother, my brother slightly older, would be there with me, but that was little comfort to me. And while, why my my mother enrolled us, I stayed close to her side, but my brother Jean lured me into the playroom to see a special toy or a game. Being inside overly long, perhaps only a few minutes really, I sensed that something was wrong and panic hit me. Tearing back outside, I saw that my mother was gone. Jean held me tight, uh, fast to keep me from running after the car that took her away and he was crying too as he held me. Thus began my school days at Holy Rosary Mission on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I hated my brother for his betrayal, but later realized that he did it only to spare our mother further heartbreak, added to the terrible sadness she felt over what she had to do. I forgave him. I spent the rest of my school years at the mission, graduating in 1952. Over those years, I met good people, teachers, administrators, and fellow students, and some have become lifelong friends, and I hold most in good memory. Life would have been better if I had brought my brothers, or if I and my brothers could have stayed in Wombly, my hometown, uh, with our mother in our home. Looking back now, I see wonderful times with relatives, childhood friends, and old people especially. If the mission meant to kill the Indian in me, and I don't believe that that was their intent, it would have been futile anyway, given the fullness and richness of my cultural world at Wombly, Wombly even in those few months I spent at home each year. Most certainly, life in school was often very hard, especially for our little ones. There was debilitating homesickness. Discipline was strict, and spankings were administered for many infractions. The food was perhaps nutritious, but seldom appetizing. In the crowded dormitories, disease such as measles and whooping cough spread rapidly and laid up many students at any time. But as with children everywhere, there was also warm friendship, joy, and laughter, adventure, and much mischief. I survived bullies who were the scourge of school life there. The hierarchy among the students was something akin to the Serengeti food chain, <laughs> with the youngest at the front of the line. For protection, we little kids would pledge for a whole year our dessert or a single pat of butter we would get at each meal. But that only worked if one's hired bully was tough as other hired bullies. And life was frustrating for adolescents. The school had some 200 on the boys' side and perhaps 250 on the girls' side. Classes were coeducational through the fifth grade. From there on, the gender separation was complete. In junior high and high school, there was, of course, there was first love, but always from afar, 
for except on Sunday afternoons and on, at m monthly dances, which we called socials, there was never a chance to even hold hands. I was not a good student nor a uh, scholarly one by any measure. My transcript bears that out. I was a problem to most of the teachers and was sent many times to the principal office, principal's office. A demerit system was in place with the worst punishment being sent to study hall instead of a movie on Saturday night. I missed many movies and spent much time struggling to write the required 500 word composition, uh, which uh, while listening to the laughter and clapping in the gymnasium above where the movies were shown. On one occasion, I was nearly expelled, saved only by my mother's intercession. I learned to survive, however, and am proud of the fact that I finished school there. And other Indian boarding school survivors have told me of their pride. But many traumatic experiences now being described in news stories and presumably in depositions are horrors I had never witnessed or even heard rumors of during my 12 years in school. And some of them involved the same school I attended a quarter century earlier. I remember no strict prohibition against speaking the Lakota language. And if there was, signals were certainly confusing for there were prayers and songs in Lakota. Student dancers performed in full regalia before basketball games. And there were cheers in Lakota during, during the games. To practice his newly acquired language, Jesuit scholastic John Bride regaled young students with the Odyssey and the Iliad, much improvised and all in Lakota. This is not to deny the hardship I experienced in the lonesomeness, strict discipline, and constant survival struggle. But by the time I graduated, conditions were so much improved. I do not mean to try to discredit those who might rightly be seeking justice in lawsuits, the courts will bear, uh, uh, decide their veracity. But perspective is needed and we must look to various experiences among our people in order to achieve it. My story is intended to help provide that and there are many others with whom I am, I am in touch who tell much the same story that I do. My greatest motivation for toughing it out was the fact that the person who placed me in the school and kept me there was the one who loved me the most and cared the most about my future. That, of course, was my Lakota mother. Knowing that, I was able to endure. I have no regrets. For any measure of success, success I have achieved, I owe much to my education at Holy Rosary Mission, which is now Red Cloud Indian School. So that was the beginning of uh, what I wanted to tell. Those were the the things that I, I, t I told about. My commentary, uh, there, there's a part in here about commentary that I wrote about through all these times. And one of them was this, uh, was uh, what I call victimhood. And uh, victimhood to me is a, a way of life in which we take it upon ourselves constantly be reminding ourselves that, that we are victims, that our people were put upon badly throughout history. And uh, in the boarding schools and warfare and, and uh, uh, now they're using terms like Holocaust to describe you know, what happened to the Indians over the years. And I just noticed something that I picked up over at the center here. This is called the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota on the Nebraska border is one of the poorest places in the Western Hemisphere. Only Guatemala, Par Paraguay, Bolivia, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Haiti are, are poorer. And it goes about telling about uh, adult alcoholism rates on the reservation have been estimated to exceed 65%. One in five children is born with alcohol fetal syndrome. And it, it tells all about it. And what this is done for is, is a, a good cause. Uh, it's the battle for white clay to get those liquor stores, or actually beer stores, uh, shut down uh, to 
quit supplying the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation with so much of this and contributing to this uh, great degree of alcoholism that uh, uh, is affecting the whole reservation. And, but I think another thing that it does is it tells us, it continuously reminds us that we are the victims. And then so we uh, carry that burden with ourselves. And I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, but you can't deny that history. You can't tell the people we didn't suffer. We can't tell the people that that history didn't happen. But uh, I think I quote uh, uh, one great uh, woman author uh, who tells us that no matter how painful or anything, history cannot be unlived. And the best thing you can do is accept it and move on. Don't let it drag you down. So that, that was one of the things I was commenting on because so, in so much you, you take Indian studies courses in college, they really hammer at these young kids, you know, about you got to remember, continuously remember what happened to our people. And I really think that that's putting an awful burden on them, even as they study and try to break out of uh, this helplessness and everything else. So that's one of the things. And this has caused quite a stir. And as I write, I get a lot of email. And if from the anonymous places, I, I shut down the blog that I had because of the horrible, cruel things that were being said about me and my family and everything else, attacking me for some of the commentary that I make. And so, but anyway, that, that's, that's the way it is. And that is what happens in this anonymous world of cyberspace, right? So uh, that's the kind of commentary. And also trying to address other things uh, that we have on our reservations, a high degree of unemployment, the lack of development, and why that is, from what I have learned in our efforts to help tribes develop their industries. And those aren't always good things for us to, or for some of our people to hear. That it, a lot of it is really up to us. That history, if it's proved anything, is that nobody can do it for us. We have to do it. My God, the government somewhat has tribed or, or tried but, and put a lot of money into the effort. Good people have tried, but until we take it upon ourselves, we're not going to deal with the problem. And that's what I, I'm trying to do. And, uh, but, but that offends some people who take this approach. When I used to testify in Congress, it was always for increased appropriations or something beneficial for the tribes. And when I first got to Washington, I started almost all my testimony by reminding the chairman, you know, I'm representing the poorest people in the United States, the high, with people with the highest infant mortality, the lowest life expectancy, the highest degree of poverty, and on and on and on. And I used to open up all my testimony that way, and finally it got to hit me. Am I bragging about this? You know, I come from the poorest country. We're number one. You know, that type of thing. <laughs> You know, what, what, what am I saying? So I just quit doing that, you know, just trying to address the problem instead of uh, trying to uh, lay everybody else on a guilt trip. So uh, those are the things in my commentary. I also try to include humor in, in the book because Indians have a good sense of humor, don't they? Don't they have Sibi yet? I mean, he does, right off the bat, when I first met him, he came in, I can't remember what he said. And I thought he was a Pawnee, and that's a <laughs> offending to the Sioux to think you're a Pawnee. And that's a mortal sin or something close, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I, I tried to bring up some humor uh, in, in my stories, too, because there was, there was a lot of humor in, that, uh, in my school. Uh, and part of my talk about the Indian schools was uh, mission school football. And if you, do you mind my reading from my book? 
Uh, I said, uh, this was when everybody was upset about different things. If your team was the Indians or your team was the Redskins or anything else, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, effort to make you get rid of it, to dump that, right? You change your name. And so during that time, as I, I said, I don't recall that our athletic teams uh, even had a nickname and, or mascot aside from our school name, Holy Rosary Mission, in those times. At tournaments, we were usually introduced by announcers simply as Indians. Uh, we weren't offended, only chagrin chagrined that all other tribal schools in the tournament carried the same name. <laughs> <clears throat> Later on, a campus-wide contest was held in the name Charging Crusaders was selected for obvious reasons that pleased our Jesuit faculty. Under legendary uh, Lakota coach Bob Clifford, our basketball team was known throughout the state for its winning record. But few people remember our early days in football back in the late 1940s. Perhaps it's just as well. At a school reunion, one of our alumni suggested that our football team should have been known as the Mission Impossibles. <laughs> Ours was a six-man six football program, a quarterback, fullback, halfback, a setter, and two ends. But we were a only able to muster a first string and three subs that were willing to play, given the ridiculous uniforms and dangerous equipment that school could gather from the attic. But having only nine players was okay because we didn't have enough equipment to out outfit a whole second string anyway. The first team played both offense and defense, and the subs usually just helped injured, injured players off the field <laughs> and filled in while they were resuscitated and bandaged up. <laughs> Our original uniforms were straight out of the Jim Thorpe era, mothball smelly from the attic and dangerous to play in. We were ridiculed by the BIA boarding school uh, uh, jocks. They had another boarding school up at Pine Ridge, uh, a federal one by their jocks, uh, and they would uh, uh, comment that we were the only team around that could fold up our helmets after the game and keep them in our back pocket. <laughs> the helmets were flat from years of storage and pressed in our cheeks when we put them on and making our lips pucker up like guppies. <laughs> but one of the priests at the school appealed to a Jesuit university for its cast-offs since that college, Marquette University, I think it was, had discontinued its football program some years before. The colors weren't our school colors, but the outfits were better than our old ones. We couldn't use much of the surplus college uniforms and equipment because they were much too big for our scrawny Lakota boys. With many of the jerseys, when we'd tuck them in, the only the top number, a top of the number could be red. So, <laughs> Number 88, for example, looked like double zeros. Uh, number 11 was the only one the referees could make out with any certainty, which is probably why that uh, unfortunate player always had the most penalties. But we had to tuck them in because if we didn't, the jerseys would come down to our knees and make us r run like Aunt Louise. The new old helmets we got from the college were molded leather with cross reinforcing stripes over the top. They were very heavy and one running back would sometimes throw his hel helmet over to the sideline just before the ball was snapped because it bounced down over his eyes when he ran. This was not deemed illegal in our outdated rule books, only dumb. <laughs> most players that we, or most schools that we played in our four game season were in small off reservation boarding to our border towns and the gridiron was usually marked off in lime in some cow pasture. Not a few slam dunk touchdowns were foiled by fresh cow patties. Sandburrs were another problem. They would stick to the scruffy football and were the bane of quarterbacks. But the cow patties and sandburgs uh, gave great incentive for players to avoid getting tackled, which made for some powerful running backs. We found a strategic advantage in our uh, Lakota language. When our quarterback would forget the signal numbers, for example, he would just shout out the play in Lakota instead. Opposing coaches would complain, but no one could find anything in the rule book that prohibited 
calling signals in Lakota. Many of our cheers were in Lakota as well, like this one. Timsilala, Timsilala, sha, 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 shred em up, shred em up, ra, 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 tapalala, tapalala, ichu po, rosary, rosary, e a po. The cheer was about carrots, which is Timsilasha, is carrot. And although it didn't make much sense, we hoped that the strange incantation would have the same chilling effect on our opponents as the battle, uh, Lakota battle cry, Hoka He, which were the last words that rang in the ears of many blue coats at Little Bighorn. Although the Lakota code talker strategy didn't help much, people in the border town still complained that our, it was unsportsmanlike, unfair, and perhaps even un-American. We didn't win many games, actually. I can only recall one victory on our first season. But we always had a rollicking good time, and at game's end, we would sing out our school victory march as we cleaned manure out of our cleats and picked sandbergs off each other's uniforms. Some of the younger generation up at Pine Ridge would undoubtedly say that this is just another, another one of those I walk to school 10 miles in a blizzard type stories. But it's all true. Just ask any old mission school survivor. You can tell who they are by the gimpy walk and permanent crick neck from heavy football helmet. <laughs> so I tried to, even in those rugged days of boarding school life, bring some humor to the thing. Thank you. Uh, I also tried to include uh, unsung heroes. So these were people who don't get the coverage and the praise that, say, Russell Means gets or, you know, any of the, uh, those leaders. And I have nothing against Russell. He died recently. Uh, and, uh, but he, and he and I were friends off and on through all of that time. Mostly off, off and on. Uh, but uh, so I, I wrote about uh, many of these these heroes that uh, to put some place in the history books for them, and I think you would read those. So one of the things I noted in my book was uh, I told you about Helen Peterson, who really got me back into into Indian affairs in, in the Indian world. But there were so many of them that, in my experience with the National Congress of American Indians, were women. And uh, uh, there was uh, uh, one, uh, Lucy Covington, her name was, she was from the Colville tribe in, uh, of say, or, uh, in Washington State. And uh, it was strange about her because she was half Jewish and half uh, whatever her tribe was up there, I can't remember what it was. It was Colville Reservation. But I can't. And uh, uh, Anne and I got to know her very well. But uh, she was fighting against uh, what was called termination. That's where Congress was trying to uh, sever the relationship between the federal government and Indian tribes as a means of saving money, but mostly as a means of just getting rid of the tribes. And she fought against that very effectively. Another one was a woman named uh, Esther Ross, Anne is my brain. She, you know, I could start saying something and she'll finish a sentence for me. I, I love her. Uh, Esther Ross, and Esther was a woman from a tiny Stillaguamish tribe, and it was an unrecognized tribe. The federal government had long since just abandoned the tribe and, and left it up there. So they uh, were trying to pull together to get the federal government to recognize them again. And she was quite a fighter. And I tell the story there, where the first time I saw her was, uh, I went to a meeting up uh, affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians up in Spokane or somewhere. And there was a big meeting room in two aisles. Uh, and in each aisle they had an open microphone. So people were uh, waiting in line to uh, speak to the panel that was up there. And uh, I saw this woman coming up with a walker hobbling up in, in line, and she finally got to the head of the line, and uh, the chairman, who is a fairly young man, 
was, would always call upon someone else. And he, he left there standing there for a long time. And I asked my friend, who has uh, happened to be the president of the National Congress of American Indians, why are they being so rude to her? And he said, you'll see. And finally, uh, she got recognized. And she had this high, crackly voice that was strident, you know. And she was telling about her tribe. And she was asking why they wouldn't help her get recognized in this. And she went through this uh, whole thing and took a long time to make her point. And so uh, my friend said, that's why they <laughs> she does this every time. And he said, why don't you help her? He told me. So I went up to her and I told her, introduced myself at the, as director of the National Congress. And I said, before I leave office, your tribe will be recognized. And she looked at me and she said, I've heard that line before and we will see, wait and see if you can, <laughs> if you can deliver on that big talk. So I had to, right? And sure enough, we got her recognized. But uh, and she, I think I, I said in you that she pestered her way to success. She would go to Washington always one way because that's all she could afford. And uh, uh, depend on people to take care of her. And she stayed with Ann and I at our house. And then a lot of times even the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they were not generous people, would take up a collection to get her home, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But their their attitude is to get her the hell out of here. <laughs> Our attitude is that you know help the poor lady. And uh, uh, but in even tough old Senator Scoop Jackson from Washington, he would bug out when his staff told her uh, <laughs> Esther's coming. But a lot of times she headed him off, and he'd say, "I've got to be on the floor to vote." And no, no, no. He, she held him there and had her say. And I really admired her, but she was finally successful. And that's one of the stories that I tell in here. I, I really became I, really fond of her, you know. And uh, she, uh, there was a book that was written about her and said that, uh, that she looked at me as her son almost at the, at the end. We fought a good fight together. And, uh, uh, then I also try to... Uh, Address, how much time do I have? I, it's pretty close, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, some of the spiritual uh, and religious things. I'm not a, a spiritualist or a holy man or anything, but I, I really gained a, a depth, I think, of feeling uh, for about. Uh, Oh, about what it what it has meant to me, and in there, I'd like to read just a very short piece of one. Very short. This tells about uh, the Pawnee reburial that occurred out on Roger's property, and how touching that was, and and uh, everything, and what what it brought to me. Even uh, those pesky Pawnees got such deep souls. <laughs> uh, tell him basically hear about what Roger had uh, talked about first when the historical society got into uh, their battle with the Pawnees and were so rude and uh, everything. But uh, I said, uh, in 2005 at the memorial feast and giveaway marking the end of the year of mourning of the death of my sister Shirley Plume, I brought Roger into our family. In the Hunkapi ceremony, that's the making of relatives ceremony, they call it. That day I said this of Roger. In Lakota culture, as in many Native American societies, the clown is an important member of the clan or band. He brings happiness, and sometimes his humor brings ridicule on anyone who tries to seize power and bully the people. The Heoka is the Lakota clown, a holy man of sorts. Because Roger Welch uses his humor to give joy and laughter, but also use it, uses it as a weapon in defense of Indian people and their tribes 
and all oppressed people. I gave him the name Heoka Tarpejuta, clown medicine. Roger Welsh's medicine is powerful indeed, and his heart is big. Thank you very much. I hope that, um, thank you, Chuck. I hope that you will all join us over at the center for refreshments, a chance to talk to Chuck, a chance to pick up a copy of his book for him to sign it. Um, he's a wonderful man, as I think you know. There's a, one of the most uh, prolonged stories in pioneer history, one of the elements that all of you have read anything at all in Western history have run into, is the long story of the Indian who carries off the poor white woman to, quote, a fate worse than death. What is often not said about that story, however, is that very often when captive white women were given the chance to return to civilization, they optioned not to go back, but to stay with their Indian captors. We have a woman like that with us here today. Um, Ann Trimble was carried off by this rural Lakota 50 years ago, but has heroically decided to stay with him. And Ann, if you'll come up, I have a, a present for you here. This, uh, this is often done in native circles, as many of you have seen. Um, and I would like to give this dance shawl to my sister-in-law uh, in thanks for her taking care of this old geezer up here <laughs> and uh, helping him remember things. Oh, and thank you beautiful. for driving him out here today. Oh, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> okay, everybody, over there. Can I add one, one more thing to that, though? Uh, when I married Anne, I was teased quite a bit because her maiden name was Savage. And <laughs> Pick up a copy of the Prairie Fire if you like. I have an article in there about returning land to tribal ownership. Come on over and talk with Chuck. Good meeting. Hello, I said. Hope you like. Let me go out this way. Yeah, I just wanted to say hello to this woman. I remember you from last time I talked here. Hi, good to Rod. see you, my um, friend. Thank you very much for coming. Big old bugger. You. <laughs> Look who's talking. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hey, I've got a project for you. Oh, Would you, can you stand oh yeah. Give me sure. Yes. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, gentlemen. There we go. Maybe we can get Roger in between. <sighs> Uh. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed it. Very oh, much. my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>